This is the beginning of a new series that is all about the game design of Yu-Gi-Oh! For those that don't know, game design refers to the rules and systems of the game. Visual design is, of course, the art of a game, while game design is everything basically in the manual. It's a wide topic which requires multiple parts to fully dissect. Today, I want to lay the groundwork of the game in order to expand on this groundwork in later parts of the video. So if you enjoy this type of content, be sure to like the video as I want to make this a multi-part series. And with all that out of the way, my name is Avery, and this is a Design of Yu-Gi-Oh! series. Dark World Dealings, to draw one card, discard one card. Hand Destruction, discarding two magical mallets to draw the final really two cards of one deck. <laughs> Setting three cards face down. You know you got four darks my turn is over. Before we had the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game, there was merely Yu-Gi-Oh! Game King, a weekly series on Shonen Jump about a boy and his pharaoh who challenges various evildoers to varied games. Originally, they played several different games, be it board games, dice games, gambling, it didn't matter at the time. Eventually, Kazuki Takahashi, its creator, God rest his soul, decided he wanted to put Magic the Gathering as one of the games that was played. Due to legal reasons, he couldn't, of course, and so he ended up creating Duel Monsters. Now, Duel Monsters was an instant hit with the readers, making it be brought back time and time again, until it eventually took over the entire series. When the anime rolled around, Duel Monsters had already swallowed the franchise, making the anime centered around it. Initially, Duel Monsters, as seen on the anime, didn't have concrete rules and was very loose, but as printings of the TCG started happening in Japan, quickly the anime and manga started following strict rules as well. Yu-Gi-Oh! The Card Game was originally built to be read and watched, not played. This is why many of its earliest design decisions are the way they are. They're there to make manga readers more excited. One of the main examples is the numbers. Each player, of course, has 8,000 life points, and monsters have attack and defense stats in multiples of 100, for the most part. It's pretty well known in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community that you could reduce all numbers in the game by 100 and have the game barely change. 80 life points for each player, and monsters with 18 attack or 30 attack for monsters with 1,800 or 3,000 attack, respectively. What this reading fails to account for, however, is the emotional impact of the numbers. What's more exciting, when the antagonist summons a monster with 3,000 attack, or when they summon one with just 30? Having such big numbers makes reading the manga or playing the game more exciting, even if they have two meaningless zeros on the attack and defense. In another example, the damage rules are also in place for Spectacle. In Magic the Gathering, for example, you either hit your opponent directly for full damage or hit a creature and deal no damage to the enemy player. In Yu-Gi-Oh, however, two attack position monsters hitting each other makes the player with less attack take damage. This helps the spectacle of the fight as both combatants always are inching closer and closer to defeat rather than that only happening in big swings like in Magic. Furthermore, the attack and defense position mechanic helps signal the intentions of the characters. A character swapping all their monsters to defense mode clearly signals they want to play defensively, while one switching a defensive monster to attack clearly signals an offensive push. In games with no attack or defense positions, wanting to do a defensive play often boils down to not attacking with a monster. That can make the reader confused. Why did they not attack there? Did they forget? With attack position and defense position, it becomes clear. The character swapped the monster to defense for a defensive play, and thus it can't attack. Way more clear on the intentions of the character. But all that is in regards to the game being played in the manga. It all carried over to the physical game though, but what about the changes that came to its transition in real life cards and with real gameplay? The transition from mechanics, only possible in the manga to real life, led to many interesting and key decisions that would shape the game forever. The first of such changes was the fusion deck, later renamed to the extra deck. The extra deck is one of, if not Yu-Gi-Oh's most insane, brilliant, and game-changing innovations. Some would say it's even toxic. In the anime and manga, the characters used a card called polymerization in order to fuse monsters together into new monsters with new designs and powers. In the realm of fiction, such a mechanic is great and exciting, but in real life, the fusions needed to be actual physical cards. Thus, the fusion deck was born to house these cards summoned off of polymerization. The fusion deck would sleep tight for a while, however. For the first few years of the game's life, it would be merely a gimmick and not used in competitive play. More interesting than the mechanics added to smooth out the transition is a mechanic that wasn't added, a way to induce deck diversity. The vast majority of card games have mechanics in place to prevent players from just placing all the best cards in the game in one deck. In Magic, there are colors. In Pokemon, there are energy cards, etc. 
This led to the first few years of Yu-Gi-Oh being dominated by good stuff decks, decks that are just piles of the 40 best cards in the format. Most decks also shared a big pool of staple cards as well too. This would lead to the eventual introduction of archetypes later down the line in order to solve this problem and bring more order to this chaos. The first few years of Yu-Gi-Oh were marked by one thing, playing with what you got. But now I also want to talk about in this video, the era between the release of the game all the way to Gladiator's Assault, with of course GOAT and Reaper format being the main historic formats of this era. There was little draw power or the ability to search for specific cards in your deck, being mostly limited to cards like Reinforcement of the Army and Mystic Tomato. It means that, for the most part, the cards that you saw in your opening hand were most of the cards you had access to. In a 10-turn game, for example, you'd see 11 cards from your deck. Six of them, over half, would be in your opening hand. Games in this style often felt like playing with an incomplete toolbox. In one game, your opening hand had monster removal and beaters, but no back row removal, for example. And that meant you had to play around that. In another game, you could lack monster removal rather than back row removal simply because of the different cards in your hand. The same thing applies to the opponent. Sometimes they don't draw monster removal, or they don't draw beaters, etc. Here, what makes duels unique were big imbalances which affected players in massive game-determining ways. But it wouldn't stay that way for long. In 2007, the set Gladiator's Assault was released, which introduced the Gladiator Beast archetype, and they changed everything. So much so that they became Tier 0 overnight. All the Gladiator Beasts, after battling an opponent's monster, would send themselves back to the deck and summon a different Gladiator Beast from the deck, dubbed the quote-unquote tag-out mechanic. This means that any Gladiator Beast on the field can freely be exchanged to any other Gladiator Beast in your deck. You have archetypal searching. If an opponent's monster is giving you trouble, you can tag out for Gladiator Beast Mermelio, who can destroy monsters. If it's a spell or trap card, then Bestiari, which used to be at 1, can destroy them. This means that you were no longer reliant on the luck of the draw to see your outs and boss monsters. Previously, you were restricted to what you drew. Did you draw back row removal? Did you draw a way to destroy the opponent's monsters, etc.? Previously, Yu-Gi-Oh! was about winning with what you were given by your deck. Now all the tools you need are always accessible. At no point in the game will you be denied access to Bestiari or Mermelio. You'll never be in awkward spots where you need removal but don't have it. You can always tag out for them. The big imbalance from the GOAT era is no longer around. Now games have small imbalances rather than massive ones between games. That wasn't the only innovation brought by the Gladiators, however. Enter Gladiator Beast Geyserus. Geyserus brought a true revolution to the extra deck, and arguably changed it forever. Geyserus was, outside of Metamorphosis and Instant Fusion shenanigans, the first good extra deck monster. Geyserus simply needed Bestiari and another Gladiator Beast to be on the field, and you could summon him instantly by tagging out the two monsters, and then you could use Geyserus' effect to pop two cards on the field. Furthermore, Geyserus would tag out into two more Gladiator Beasts from your deck, allowing you to extend your plays even more after summoning him. If the relentless searching of this style of decks didn't already guarantee you'd always find your playmakers, this new style of extra deck monster means that you don't even have to draw playmakers. They're always accessible in the extra deck. As the years progressed more and more, generic extra deck monsters were created as well, meaning even decks that don't have extra deck monsters to go into still have consistent removal options. It's a new age of Yu-Gi-Oh with a style of play completely foreign to everything that came before with extremely consistent decks. Now all that was needed was to pick up the pieces after a turn, which is where we start hitting the modern age of Yu-Gi-Oh. Duelist Alliance is regarded as one of, if not the most influential set in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. We've talked about it in our Yu-Gi-Oh retrospective series, Shameless Plug. It introduced the Pendulum Monsters. It introduced several fan-favorite archetypes and game support to many others, being a huge jump in the game's power level and turned the world upside down. Such a massive set would warrant its own section, and rightfully so, the set was bananas. Duelist Alliance's most impactful archetypes such as Burning Abyss, Shadals, and Yang Zings all had one thing in common, and that was the Graveyard. This is the set that normalized the Graveyard as a meaningful and important part of your game plan. Older decks in Yu-Gi-Oh's history like the Light Swarms of the Dragon Rulers did use the Grave, but they were outliers. The Graveyard only became the standard place to make plays from Duelist Alliance onwards. All of the Burning Abyss monsters had effects when sent to the Grave. So did all the Shadals. The Yang Zings all summoned more monsters when destroyed. When facing against a Duelist Alliance, deck, oftentimes trying to break the opponent's board made the situation even worse for you. That is to say, Duelist Alliance introduced recovery to decks. It means that now you can't fully take the opponent out of the game by merely wiping their board. Follow-up is guaranteed. 
as long as you're alive, you're still in the game and able to come back as whenever the opponent outed your board, you'd gain the resources back to make new boards. This is also the reason why a lot of players in today's game will say, as long as you have one life point, you're still in the game. Life points don't matter in Yu-Gi-Oh! when you think about it in that regard. Your only limit and how long you could come back is the resources in your deck and extra deck, i.e. your deck as a resource. Now, how many times you can make a combo is a real variable that changes from deck to deck, and that can impact games. Repeatability has joined the fray as another measurement of a deck's power. After Duelist Alliance, the game kept evolving. The main innovation of this era is the now widespread negativity, the so-called disruption. In this stretch, the game unimaginably changes from what it was. Outside of Infernity, we have the first instance of the modern combo deck, that being DDDs. We also have the first generic and easy to make negates in the game, like Crystal Wing Synchro Dragon, allowing a multitude of decks to put disruption on the field. This is where it all starts coming together. The archetypal search and extra deck introduced by the Gladiator Beasts, the recovery and resilience of the Duelist Alliance decks, alongside new concepts, resilience, hand traps, the Raigeki economy, baiting, etc. The game has infinitely evolved past its GOAT era version and is much, much more complicated. This is the point where we get back to the present. Analyzing this era of Yu-Gi-Oh! is now analyzing the current game, which means we have reached the end of part one, sadly. But if you want to see more of this series, be sure to destroy the boo-boo stain off of that like and subscribe button and leave a comment letting me know you want to see more because I enjoy making these videos. But thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.